for having us. It's quite an honor to be presenting uh, here with you. We are so excited to share with you what we've been working on together for the past three to four years now, I believe, um, and trying to bring some of these new materials uh, to the clinic. So new materials for 3D printing, um, we'd like to talk about where we are today and, of course, where we think we are going next. Uh, again, Dr. Shaw is uh, co-founder of Dimension Inks. So every day that I go to work, I face three-dimensional challenges. That's what we do as reconstructive surgeons, whether it be breast reconstruction, craniofacial deformities, or hand and lower extremity uh, reconstruction. So thinking about 3D problems is every day. Uh, for decades, really centuries, plastic surgeons have been coming up with innovative techniques to solve these challenging um, conditions that are often congenital and sometimes uh, inflicted by you know, cancer and other trauma. Um, and it's time for kind of new ideas. So thanks to most of the people in this room and all the folks that are attending this conference, we now have you know, decades of experience uh, and in using patient imaging, advanced software analysis, and this is shared uh, with me by one of our colleagues who ha who's been involved in virtual surgical planning for a number of years. And you can see in the 1990s, we have some lovely anatomic models. You can see the resolution of the resin printing is not optimal, but you know, gets the surgeon to hold the defect in their hand. More anatomic models of craniosynostosis. And we use these models for studying the anatomy before going into the OR, for mechanical testing, and just to really understand um, the pathologic condition. As we move forward in the years, we've moved on to using these models to create surgical guides um, for Lefort 1 advancements and bilateral sagittal split osteotomies of the mandible. And of course, even more complex um, craniofacial deformities. I think the model out is out in the lobby. Um, just last year, uh, the folks in New York used virtual surgical planning to help them identify the vasculature of the conjoined twins um, and really plan a successful separation of these twins. So patient-specific implants um, have really skyrocketed in the past couple of years. You can see that multiple companies have solutions for cranioplasty as well as mandibular reconstruction. And these have been extremely useful. Um, you know, inert plastics that can resurface the cranium. So this is a, a nine-year-old girl who, um, for a, after a tumor, um, had much of the posterior vault of her cranium missing. So she was, you know, had no protection of her brain, had to wear a helmet. Um, but custom peak implant uh, was fabricated, and now she has a nice looking contour and is able to go without a helmet. Similarly, this is another case of a congenital fibrous dysplasia where the bone is just um, pathologic and needed to be resected. And you can see that it involves the superior lateral orbital rim, which is a very complex 3D structure. Um, and we were able to, again, create a customized uh, polymer implant for her. So we're really ready for the next generation of custom implants. And I'm really excited that Dr. Shah is going to talk about some of the materials that we can use to get there. When we face these very challenging problems, I think it's important for engineers and surgeons to come together and talk about what the problem is and what, the, what available technologies there are. Um, again, we've been doing this for a long time, and we can come up with some way to reconstruct. It may not be the ideal way. It may not give you the perfect contour, but we are pretty good at solving a problem. Um, but we are absolutely eager and willing to adopt new technologies. And I think through the 3D printing, we will absolutely create a paradigm shift in the way that we approach these things. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. So first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to talk at this, this keynote. We're very excited to really um, share with uh, this audience what we've been doing at the interface of 3D printing and regenerative engineering. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the field of regenerative engineering, it's really a paradigm where we're trying to tissue re uh, regenerate tissues with cells, and manipulating those cells within different material scaffolding systems with or without stimulating factors such as regulators. 
We focus on particularly the scaffolds, so the materials that make up these artificial environments for the cells. And with these materials, we're able to control the bioactivity, the architectural uh, components, the mechanical and degradation properties that really influence how cells behave and how tissue successively regenerates. So what 3D printing has enabled is really the ability to develop more sophisticated scaffolding systems to recreate and regenerate multiple different types of tissues with um, more sophistication. So from the soft tissues that are multicellular and more complex organs to the ones that are more load-bearing. And ideally, we would want to have one printer that can print everything, but it's really hard to print a variety of different tissues with just a minimum number of biomaterials that are printable. And so interestingly, this was um, talked about in last year's keynote, 2016 keynote by Dr. Hollister, where one of the questions was, what is the major technological gaps uh, in the field? And what he said, uh, he said, it's a really our ability to expand the number of biomaterials that we can print, really being able to print a much broader range of soft materials. And coincidentally, this is what we do in our lab. And so we're trying to take what was initially available several years ago and expand the biomaterial palette to be able to tune the systems that are 3D printing, that we are 3D printing, to regenerate a variety of different tissue types. So within these inks, what we call the ones that have cells within the inks, we call bioinks. The ones that are acellular, we call biomaterial inks. And the biomaterial inks are inks that we can print, but then we can seed cells on top, and they have uh, a sophisticated functionality that induces specific type of regeneration. And within these inks, we can have a variety of different factors, from different bioactive factors, like peptides and growth factors, to different particles that can reinforce the material to even extracellular matrix, matrix particles and cells. The challenge is that you know, we can tailor the different compositions and the different concentrations, but really we have to be able to do all these renditions and tuning the properties without compromising printability. And this is one of the main challenges, especially in the bio ink development, um, where we need to have extrudable materials. Uh, we, we focus on extrusion-based, filament-based uh, 3D printing. Uh, we need to have materials that are self-supporting once they're printed. And ideally, especially when we want to create more sophisticated multi-material constructs, we want to make inks that are compatible when they're printed together. And this is the ideal scenario where we have multiple different inks, different cell types, uh, different material and bioactivity that can be printed in one construct, just like we see in uh, natural tissues and organs. So two of the main platforms that we've been developing over the years in my lab have been based off of partially cross-linked hydrogels, and these are cell-compatible materials for soft tissue regeneration. And these are, um, plat this is a platform that enables us to print cells and print multiple different cell types. The other platform is our particle-laden inks and what we call 3D painting. And we call them 3D paints because they have very similar composition to regular household paint. And these are acellular materials but have a great amount of functionality. And so we focus on material platforms because we want to create multiple different types of biomaterials. We don't just want to create one for one you know, material and another for uh, a different uh, material and a different printer. We want to be able to make, use the same platform to print multiple different types of materials. So I'll talk about some of the uh, examples that we're using these hydrogels for specific clinical uh, applications as well as the platform itself. And what we've been able to develop is a platform based off of polyethylene glycol cross-linking. And this uses a PEG cross-linker. So PEG is uh, commercially available. It's very biocompatible. It's been used in several uh, clinically approved or FDA approved clinical products. Um, it has variations of physical and chemical properties. It's commercially available. And it's relatively inexpensive. So what we can do is take this PEG cross-linker, and this has reactive groups for different reactive um, groups on the polymer itself. So we, we are able to use different types of polymers from synthetic to natural polymer systems. And what we can do is we can cross-link it lightly with or without the addition of cells. And uh, it cross-links lightly so that it changes the, the flow properties so that it's both extrudable but yet self-supporting. 
because the main uh, challenge is in bioinks especially is to be able to print materials that are both cell compatible but also can maintain the 3D architecture that you want to design. And so what you can do is extrude it, print it into the architecture you want, and then you can tailor the, tuna, you can tailor the biological activity, the um, uh, degradabil degradability, as well as the material uh, mechanical properties by following it up with a secondary crosslinker. Um, and this really enables the tunability of these scaffolds. And you can see here, this is what our PEGX systems look like. This is particularly made with gelatin. And gelatin is naturally derived material um, that comes from collagen, the main protein in our bodies, so cells like this material. And we are able to build self-supporting structures that maintain the architecture very nicely. Um, we were able to print larger constructs that are more relevant to human implants. And when I talk about the ability to multi-material print, this really uh, demonstrates uh, this, uh, you know, this character in that we can print different proteins, this is gelatin and fibrinogen, in one construct. We can also print synthetic, so PEG is a synthetic polymer with gelatin. And in this case, um, we seeded cells on top of the scaffold, and we can preferentially seed cells because PEG does not have any adhesion sites to cells. So they all prefer preferentially adhere to the gelatin material. So we can really organize cells in a 3D space with multi-material 3D printing. And this is important for patterning. So this is a demonstration where we can pattern multiple cell types. These are endothelial cells that make up blood vessels and mesenchymal stem cells in green. And over time, the gelatin degrades. And this is in vitro culture, or it's cultured outside the body. And it's replaced by natural tissue that's, that's produced by these cells. And over time, you can see it's uh, the gelatin is completely degraded, but the cells proliferate and they deposit matrix in the same pattern that we printed the material. So this is important, especially when we want to self-organize these, these um, cells for more complex tissue engineering applications. The other uh, important uh, variable is customizing nanostructure as well as bioactivity. So nanostructure is an important component in tissue engineering because cells recognize nanostructural features. So we're able to incorporate different molecules like acetyl collagen as well as growth factor binding peptide amphiphiles that self-assemble into nanofibular structures. And we can also tailor bioactivity using peptide technology. Another knob that we can tune is the PEG crosslinker itself. So here this shows face plots where we identified printable regions. So the green area is where we identify the ideal printability. Um, you, changing the crosslinker to polymer ratio as well as polymer concentration. And so one of the things that you should uh, note here is that we're working at polymer concentrations that are below 5%. And this is important because Bioink development, uh, majority of the literature out there has been working with self-supporting bioinks that are beyond 5%, more in the 10% range, and that really has a detrimental effect on cells. So as you increase the polymer fraction, you decrease cellular bio viability and function. So the fact that we can work with printable uh, regimes that are below 5% really enhances the chances of cell survival after printing. And so in this, these face plots, we show that we can tailor the PEG crosslinker molecular weight, so the longer the chain, as well as the architecture. So we can have linear versus multiple branch structures. And what this enables us is to tune and add more functionality. For example, if you have a multi-arm or multi-branched crosslinker, as shown here, you can use some of the arms for the crosslinking reaction, but the other ones you can tether, tether different functionality groups like peptides, like growth factors or drugs, or even imaging particles. So we've been able to use this platform to really, again, expand what we can print with 3D printing. Um, and we've been able to create over 100 different formulations, both synthetic and natural. Um, we've been also able to customize the bioactivity, the nanostructure components, degradation, mechanical properties, without compromising the printability. And we've been able to achieve a, a wide range of mechanical properties. And this is important, especially when we want to target different tissue types. So in the soft hydrogel work, we've been able to achieve printable hydrogels in the range of 500 to 40 kPa, which, is, which covers a broad range of tissues, from fat to muscle to cartilage and even precalcified bone. So this is a platform that really can extend, again, that biomaterial palette. 
And one of the things that we also want to incorporate is how do we increase bioactivity? And bioactivity is really a term used when, uh, for materials that induce specific regeneration uh, responses. So this is an example. One of the targets in my lab is tissue engineering of the liver. And what we can do is take the tissue or organ, take the cells out, and mince it up into a hydrogel. Because it's been shown in the tissue engineering field that the extracellular matrix itself of the specific tissues can really induce stem cell differentiation into the tissue of choice. And so we took liver uh, decellularized ECM, and we compared it to collagen or madrigel. Madrigel is another biomaterial commercially available. And we cultured cholangiocytes, with the, which are the biliary epithelial cells that make up the bile ducts the branch bile ducts of the liver. And what we show is that in the type, two, type 1 collagen and madrigel, these cells don't really reminisce anything that they look like in, in the liver. But when we culture them in this liver DECM hydrogel, we get a fantastic self-assembly of these cholangiocytes really organizing into these hierarchically branched structures that are reminiscent of what we do see in the liver. And so we're trying to leverage the bioactivity of the natural matrices found in the body and incorporate that into our 3D printable structures. And for 3D printing, this allows us to guide sort of the uh, morphology and the alignment of these bile duct structures so that we can also incorporate blood vessels and the other cell types that are important for the overall functionality of the organ. I want to then shift over to another very important target, and that is um, really in close collaboration with Professor Teresa Woodruff and Dr. Monica Laranda at the Oncofertility Lab um, in, at Northwestern. And what we're trying to address is trying to engineer a bioprosthesis ovary. And this is really for patients who are suffering from cancer, female patients, pediatric in particular, where, who are survivors. So fortunately, Cancer treatments have really improved the survivability of these um, types of patients. Unfortunately, there's a significant correlation between cancer treatment and decreased, infertil decreased fertility, um, acute ovarian failure, and even decreased hormone levels. And this can make a huge impact on the quality of life of these cancer survivors. So not only do they have to survive cancer, but they can have cardiac problems or bone problems, especially when you have changes in your, in, or decreased levels of hormones. And of course, it also affects their ability to bear children. So our solution is to be able to engineer a 3D printable microenvironment to house follicles from the patient. So we isolate follicles, and follicles are the cell aggregates that eventually mature and grow into fertilizable eggs. We culture them in our artificial environments um, before the treatment. This patient then gets treatment, and then we implant the artificial uh, ovary back into the patient to recover their fertility and recover their hormone production. So one of the things that we wanted to try, and we can easily do this with 3D printing, is really what is the role of architecture? What is the optimal architecture that we should use to house these follicles? We need to increase their survival. We have to support their function. And so what we did is we simply just changed the advancing angle of our print, our, our build print. And in what we saw when we put these follicles within these scaffolds, that they tended to survive in the more tortuous scaffold architecture, so the 30 and 60 degree angles, where they can wedge themselves in pockets. Um, and so they maintain their rounded morphology. In the 90 degree scaffolds, they end up interacting with only one strut they dissociated and they ended up dying, right? So really, this is the first evidence that architecture does matter, especially in this case. So of course, we wanted to see, well, in vitro it works, but is it functional in vivo? Would it work in a, in a model, at least to start? So what we did was we took a mouse. We took the ovary out. So this mouse is sterilized. It has, does not have the ability to produce hormones. And then we took follicles isolated from a green fluorescent protein mouse. Those follicles are fluorescing green. We then culture that into the optimized scaffold and put the, implanted that into the sterilized mouse. After a week, we see that we have great vascularization. We have um, follicles of different stages from mature to the more immature. And we recover full hormone function. 
the most exciting thing is that when we mated this mouse that had the implant, it led to a bioprosthesis-derived pup. So you can see here in this picture that the pup is fluorescing green. And this shows that this is a result of these implanted follicles, right? And this is amazing because there's a lot of things that have to happen in order for live birth to occur. Importantly, after giving birth, the mother was able to lactate and raise her pup into weaning. And this really demonstrates that the implant itself is vascularized because in order for the, the mother to lactate, it needs to be uh, vascularized. Hormones need to go through her systems in order for lactation to occur. And, and vascularization is the number one challenge in tissue engineering where we need to have nutrient uh, diffusion and flow. Interestingly, we also mated this initial pup um, when it grew, and that led to the birth of bioprosthesis-derived grand pups. So all of these pups um, fluoresce, fluoresce green. Um, and this shows that the initial mouse that was born um, was normal, it had normal fertility. And this is exciting because this is truly the first demonstration of a functional implant um, implanted organ created via 3D printing. It recovers hormone function, it recovers fertility. And this is a simple um, scaffold, just changing the architecture. So we are in the midst of setting up a 3D printing center within a hospital at Northwestern in their GMP facility for future preclinical large animals, as well as clinical trials. So refocusing now on the other platform. The other platform is very different from our hydrogel systems in that they're made out of a very different components. I mentioned before, they're very similar to household paint where you have a solvent system, you have powders, and you have a polymer binder. And the neat thing about these inks is that when it's printed, it contains the majority of the particle. And this is important because the particle is one that is the functional component of the printed structure. So you want to maximize that amount. So we're able to create structures that are 60 to 90 percent the particle. Other advantages, especially about scalability, is they're um, highly scalable as far as the inks, the extended shelf lives, de very fast deposition rates. They can be handled immediately after printing. Um, we've been able to print from the very small to very large objects, and the resolution is very, very good. So our first particle-laden ink, or one of the firsts, has been focused on hyperelastic or hydroxyapatite, which is the main mineral component of natural bone. We call it hyperelastic bone for the reasons I'll, I'll show in the next slides. One of the things, fascinating things about this when we started printing hyperelastic bone is that despite the fact that it is 90 to 95 weight percent ceramic, so the hydroxyapatite component, which is very brittle, it has very flexible properties. So here you see um, the ability to fold sheets, to cut sheets, to roll them into very um, sophisticated shapes. Um, we can also print very easily more substantial load-bearing um, objects, as shown there. More complex objects, such as here. This is um, reminiscent of trabecular bone, um, as well as has high loading capacity. Spine, and the thing about these uh, inks, we can also print different parts. So this was printed in four different parts, um, and fused together here. These three parts were fused together with the addition of more ink. So you can make more complex structures, and this is all without support material needed. Because it's a room temperature printing process, what we can also do is incorporate biological agents, such as growth factors, proteins, as well as antibiotics to decrease infection rates. Um, this is an example of incorporating green fluorescent protein, and after we printed the ink, it still maintains its fluorescence. Um, and we easily can incorporate antibiotics without compromising printability. So it has very unique properties. Along with the flexibility and the bounciness of uh, this particular architecture, this really enables surgeons to manipulate this in surgery. And so one example is where we took a CT scan. This is a model of a patient with a cleft palate. We printed the structure slightly bigger than the defect, and we were able to easily press fit into the defect without the need for sutures or glues. We can also make more load-bearing um, structures. Here is a segment of a femur, and we've tested it longitudinally, showing that it, with, can, with, it can withstand loads up to 150 pounds. This is very um, 
dependent on the architecture so we can even push this by changing the architectural features. Interestingly, this particular architecture can have very different properties in another direction. So it can be very compliant in the actual direction, which is very advan advantageous to surgical implementation when you're trying to put this into a defect in the patient. Now, why is this hyperelastic? So hydroxyapatite and these elastomeric polymers that are biodegradable, they've been used in the biomedical field for a long time. Um, this showcases why ours are different. So we compared a hot melt printed uh, composite that's the same particles of polymer, same particles of hydroxyapatite. We printed it and it looks very different microstructurally. So this, we can only get 50% of this hydroxyapatite in here. This results into a fiber that's very brittle and it also covers the hydroxyapatite particles, which are the functional unit, right? And the case for the hyperelastic bone, we see a lot of porosity within the strut itself, nano and micron porosity. This allows particles to move, and because it's room temperature printed, the polymer maintains its elastic properties. Um, so this is what allows it to be hyperelastic. And we can load a lot of different, uh, a lot of uh, particles in there. The hydroxyapatite is exposed. Because of this majority porosity, we also have great absorption properties, which is very important for cell infiltration and growth factor diffusion or nutrient diffusion. Um, cells love this material. We put mesenchymal stem cells on there, and they proliferate over time. They start to deposit matrix, and they start to turn into bone cells. And this is all without the need for any growth factors in the media. So it's just the interaction of the cells with this bioactive material. We've been able to test this in a rat spinal fusion model. And what we saw is when we overlaid this on decorticated transverse processes um, on, the, on the spine, or on the transverse processes um, on the sides of the spine, we saw very good integration, tissue integration in two weeks. And if we compare it to collagen, ACS, the mineralized bone matrix, which is a cadaver-derived clinical product used in spine fusion, hydroxyapatite as a slurry, hyperelastic bone, and hyperelastic bone with uh, bone for genetic protein, which is a growth factor, we see that HB is as good as DBM. And the advantage of D, uh, HB is that it's completely synthetic, whereas it's, uh, DBM is cadaver-derived. So this really increases the reproducibility if it's synthetic of HB, and also decreases the cost. Of course, if you need a boost in osteogenic differentiation, this can also serve as an effective carrier for growth factors. We're also able to use it um, and test it in a monkey uh, in a cranial defect. And this specimen um, had a cranial defect that we didn't know what the exact size was because it had necrosis in the, in the skull. So what we did was we printed a sheet of HB in the form of a cranial um, tissue where you have sort of a sandwich culture, no porosity on the outside, and then a very uh, large pores on the inside. And once the surgeons opened there, they debrided the area, and they were able to cut that sheet so it fits perfectly and be, uh, is able to be press fit into that defect. And after four weeks, only four weeks, we have great tissue integration, we have vascularization, and we have the start of new bone formation. So this is exciting results that we're also continuing down the line. And one last example of hydroxyapatite and this hyperelastic bone material is that we're trying to use it because of its properties for soft tissue to bone healing. So in this case, this is an ACL graft, ACL repair reconstruction, where you take a graft and you thread it through bone tunnels within the bone of the knee. And what we can do is print sleeves that go around the ends of the graft, and those ends then get embedded within the bone tunnels to enhance soft tissue to bone healing. The great thing about this material is that it can be trimmed to size. It can also be sutured to the soft tissue. So it all leads to hyperelastic wounds, just really a very versatile material that is, there's nothing out there that is like that as far as orthopedic products. So it's really excited to um, partner with different people to further translate this technology. Another example I want to show is the ability to 3D print graphene. So graphene is a very unique material because it's a nanomaterial. Uh, these 3D inks are currently available um, by purchase through Sigma. And you can see here, even though it's a nano flake, it's very different from the microspheres of the hydroxyapatite, we can print them very easily. They have aligned structures, and the great thing about graphene is it's electrically conducting, and it also has been shown to be very biocompatible. So it's the most electrically conducting, about 10 times greater conductivity than most carbon-based 3D printed materials out there. Here it shows the ability to conduct electricity. 
And when we put the same cells, the mesenchymal stem cells, on top of these structures, interestingly, they start to morph into very different morphologies. These look more like neuron-like cells, where they extend their processes across multi-millimeter uh, distances. And if we take gene expression levels over two weeks, they actually start to upregulate their expression of neural and specific markers. Again, this is all without any growth factors or other bioactive components in the media, just the interaction of the cells and the material itself, which is the very first to, uh, we are the very first to show this. So we're, of course, very interested in using this, this material for potential electrogenic tissue engineering, those tissues that respond to electrical stimulation and electrical conductivity, like nerves, uh, like cardiac tissue, like muscle, which Dr. Jordan will be talking about a little bit later. Because it's from the same platform, this really also enables the ability for multi-material printing. So very easily, we're able to print hyperelastic bone with 3D graphene. We can also mix them together very easily in powder form first, or like paints, where you can mix different colors. Here, you're mixing different functionalities. And we're able to show that if you do print uh, graphene and, and the hyperelastic bone, you can boost or have dual gene expression levels of, of the MSCs, both in the neural as well as the osteogenic lineage. So I want to uh, leave with this example. And this example shows the ability to extend this platform towards printing metal structures. And I thought this would also be interesting to this audience, um, where we've been working, uh, I've been working with David Dunan since 2012 on this concept. We have a patent on this concept where we take the green bodies, we take particles that can be made from very cheap particles, or we, take, uh, we make inks from very cheap particles. It can start with the iron oxide, or we can uh, start with metal particles themselves. We can easily print them using um, our platform. And we can make, take those green bodies and put them in the furnace and transform them into metal structures. So the advantage is, is that, one, the, the um, uh, green bodies are flexible. Um, they can create hollow metal objects. So this is a box that was cut, and you can see it's hollow inside. Um, you can fuse parts together before you actually put it in the furnace, right? So you can make more complex metal structures. And of course, this is using simple cartridge-based um, printing. And because we have the great ability to mix different particle, particles very easily, now we're venturing into creating new alloy systems that are 3D printable. So here are shape memory alloys, super alloys, other biomedical alloys of interest that we're moving forward in this research. So as you can see, we've built a platform. We've been able to really extend the types of materials we can print with one uh, platform. We have about 300 particle-laden inks uh, in our lab, or over that. Um, and all these inks can be mixed together to really, um, they can be multiple material printed, they mix together to really tune device functionality and complexity. So in my lab, we've developed these platforms. And this is sort of a new method of approaching the problem. If we have platforms, we can then extend that to a lot of different materials. We've talked about medical applications, but we are also moving beyond medical, especially with the metals and ceramic printing, where we are now adventuring into the energy applications, as well as advanced structural applications. And now I'd like to refocus it back on the use of these technologies. So Dr. Jordan is going to explain some of the things that we're working with her on, on how do we use these new technologies for specifically reconstructive surgery. My goodness. So every time I hear Ramil's talk, um, you know, I've seen this materials over and over. My head starts spinning with new ideas and potential to bring it to the clinic. So I'd like to present a, just a couple of examples of a surgical wish list, what I think we can do with some of these um, new materials and new platforms, and see where we can go from here. So this is a pretty common situation. I don't know how many of you have children um, that play Little League, but a softball to the eye, uh, orbital floor fracture, um, you know, for example, this is my husband's brother after he got hit in the face with a baseball bat. Currently, there are titanium plates, there are porous polyethylene plates, all permanent materials that we can use to reconstruct the orbital floor. The problem is in children, they grow. Um, and these plates either need to come out or we need to use a resorbable system uh, right off the bat. And so I think having a tissue engineered solution, such as the hyperelastic bone, where you can fashion a patient-specific orbital floor plate is really something that we can use in the pediatric population. 
So this child, this is Alex, he was born with one side of the mandible, one side of the jaw, just smaller than the other. Um, you know, it's a, a fluke that happens in utero, and nobody really understands why it happens. Uh, but you can see the difference isn't so uh, significant when he's a young child. Um, but you can see as he gets older, the facial asymmetry really becomes more pronounced. It starts to interfere with your occlusion or the way your teeth fit together, and just overall the way that people interact with you. So again, thanks to all of our uh, imaging and software um, technologies that have been available, we were able to plan a fairly complicated uh, orthognathic surgery to try to improve the facial symmetry. And you can see what is left here on the hypoplastic uh, mandible side is a little bony defect. And so we took a piece of bone from the hip and sat there and whittled it for however long it took to get it to fit perfectly into that um, little hole. And wouldn't it be nice to just take a little piece of hyperelastic bone, cut it with scissors, and just press fit it in there? Um, you wouldn't have a scar on your hip. It would save a lot of time. And with all of this software technology, we already have the planning. We already know exactly what size piece we're going to need. Uh, so why not combine those procedures together? This is his outcome after his surgery. Um, again, another case of craniofacial microsomia causing a severe underdevelopment of the right mandible. And for her, the solution was to take a bone out of the leg and move it up there to reconstruct that side of the mandible. Um, but of course, we don't get that perfect geometry, that condyle, that TMJ joint, um, that is a very personalized 3D structure. It's not made of just bone, of course. All joints have bone, a cartilage cap, a little soft tissue, articular discs, so that we don't pop and click all the time. Um, and importantly for these kids, you want them to be able to grow with the child so that you can operate on them at a young age before they get made fun of in school, before they have problems chewing and pain in the mandible, and allow them to grow. You know, other solutions, fancy solutions that surgeons have come up with, of course, is to take a piece of cartilage and bone from the inside of the knee. So we're doing pretty dramatic surgeries. Um, we're pretty good at them. Uh, but boy, we're ready for a new solution. You know, something like composite tissue engineering, where we have the capability to engineer both soft and hard tissues, put them together, fuse them together, do multicolor printing where you have bone and cartilage together, perhaps uh, provide some gel infused scaffolds for the soft tissue work. Nobody, you know, everyone looks at 3D printing. The first thing you want to do is print an ear or print a nose. Um, we've been taking ribs out of children since the 1950s and sitting again, whittling away, uh, making these cartilage constructs uh, for children who are born with ear malformations. Um, if you're really good at it, you can do it in a reasonable amount of time. Otherwise, you're sitting there like kindergarten with tracing paper and just sitting and cutting them out. Um, so I think that's a pretty, it's time for a new solution. So these are some interesting cases. Things that you probably take for granted is the ability to just blink, to lubricate your eyes, to protect your cornea. Um, and this young girl was born with a facial palsy and just can't blink on the right side. So you can see how hard she's trying. Um, and you know, besides just the corneal injury, our everyday facial expressions, our eyes are constantly moving. And when your peers are looking at you like, why is she like, blinking kind of funny or not making the normal facial expressions. It can have severe psychosocial imp impact. So for her, just simply for eye protection, we implanted a little platinum weight in the eyelid to help it close. So this is not a dynamic reconstruction by any means. It still has people looking at you a little funny. But she does um, have some corneal protection from that. Another thing we take for granted is our smile. Um, so this uh, young toddler, uh, Again, born with craniofacial microsomia, and you know, in addition to ear uh, malformations, um, has right facial paralysis. So some of the things you can see, for example, in that first picture, he's trying to raise both of his eyebrows, but the right eye doesn't, you know, eyebrow doesn't go up quite as high as the other one. He's trying to smile in the second picture, and you can see, you know, you get that nice la nasolabial crease on the left side, but the right side is not really doing a whole lot. You know, an adult, you might think they're having a stroke or something. But if that's what you get when you're interacting with your friends and you know, this is him happy, 
your kids who can't form normal facial expressions, you, know, you think you're dumb, you think you're unfriendly, you kind of run away. Um, and so a lot of surgeries later to build a nerve conduit uh, to cross his face, take a muscle from the inside of his thigh, you know, 12 to 18 hour surgery, transfer it into the cheek, and you get what is an excellent outcome in that last photo. Um, you know, you have the ability to think about smiling, fire that large bulky muscle, and get some expression of the corner of the mouth. But obviously, you know, it's, again, extremely good outcome. Improved, but it's still bulky. It's still asymmetric. And I think it's time for new solutions. So the exciting thing about what Ramil has presented is you know, the idea of a new class of electroconductive biomaterials, the idea that we can use graphene to uh, generate a muscle unit, a nerve unit, to act as a muscle nerve interface to kind of augment whatever activity is already there. And we've started to do a little bit of that um, in a rodent model, just seeing how these materials act when you bring uh, a nerve into that environment and see if we can't regenerate some, uh, some smiles. So the question that we always get asked is, how long is this going to take? And I ask it all the time. I ask, you know, so when, I can, when can I have some of this hyperelastic bone? I got all these defects that I can fill with it. And so this is our, you know, kind of our preliminary timeline today. We have inert polymers, metals, customized plates, customized polymer implants, extremely um, high resolution imaging and uh, advanced software for ritual surgical planning. Um, and that's great. I think the next step is gonna be our single tissue graphs where you can take something like a single material, hyperelastic bone, structural implants, um, for example, to print tracheas, um, acellular, but bioactive materials, materials that interact with the body, materials that um, bring the, the wound healing environment in, bring the host cells in to regenerate um, some of these defects. And then as we move on, I think within the next 10 years or so, we're gonna move into integrated systems, things that have more than one tissue type, things that are vascularized, things that we can interact with nerves, um, send signals back to the brain and control our, our new constructs, um, incorporate more cells into these hydrogel systems, and really come up with smart materials, things that are responsive to the surrounding biochemical stimuli, hormones, um, electrical signals from the brain. And then, of course, we have to think broadly. Um, and just, I think, composite tissue regeneration, large-scale organs, multicellular organs, um, large-scale composite tissues. Maybe we can print ourselves a finger or a hand. Or, you know, really, the imagination is, um, you know, the limit here. So again, all of our acknowledgments. Um, Dr. Shaw has a number of collaborators, and of course, I too have a number of mentors in our plastic surgery division. Yes. So thank you very much for your attention. We'll like to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have way more questions than we're going to have time to take, <laughs> but um, we've got lots more opportunities. So. Um, some interesting questions. Somebody wants to know why the baby mice were fluorescent, and is that an intentional marker or part of the treatment? Yes, this is a, a used specifically to make sure that we know that the follicles that we implanted, they're the ones that fluoresce green, and so they're the follicles that lead to that fluorescent mouse. So we know that it is the result of the implant um, from that, uh, the artificial ovary. So it is a marker. Um, one, one person in the audience recently donated a kidney, and thank you for that, whoever you are, that's awesome. Um, and, and that individual's question is, what is um, your guesstimate on how many years until a complex organ like a kidney um, may be printed and functional? Um, that's going to take multiple years, right? I think on the range of you know, even you know, 30 to 50 years because of the complexity of, of the organ. So this is talking about actual replacement of a full human-sized organ. And this is because a lot of the biological complexities are still not known as far as, you know, what signals do we provide it so that cells can assemble into something that's functional. However, a stepping stool to that, 
you know, that goal is trying to use, uh, to develop these sort of mini organs or organs that can be used um, while or extend the life of patients that are on the transplant waiting list. So that's some, a step that it's not a full organ replacement, but it may be a supportive um, sort of mini organ that can be used. Right now, people are developing systems that are in vitro systems that can be also be used using these 3D printed structures as uh, drug toxicity screening and uh, drug discovery that are uh, more patient specific. So there's a lot of different, um, I guess, near term as well as longer term uses for this type of technology when it comes to organ function and replacement. Thank you. How do you deal with sterilization of porous objects? Uh, that's a great question. So one of the things that we are also focusing on is the translation of these technologies, of course. If we want to put them in patients, sterilization is a very important factor. And so it depends on the material. Um, we are investigating different strategies to sterilize it, uh, whether it be during the process and keep everything sterile or post-processing. So some of the 3D paints or particle-laden inks, um, uh, they, we're exploring different end um, sterilization techniques that doesn't influence the material properties or the bioactivity. So that's something that um, uh, we are still developing. Um, do you use any physics simulations for implantation outcomes? That's, that's also a great question. That would be fantastic if we had. So one of the things when it comes to materials that are degrading in the body, um, really it is unfortunately still on a trial and error basis because one, it depends on the material and the composition and two, where you're actually implanting it. You can't have the same material uh, degrade the, uh, the same way in different parts of your body. So really, to get to that point where you have simulations, where you have predictive models to uh, assess degradation and tissue remodeling in vivo will require a lot of data gathering from the tissue engineering and biomaterials community. But that's something that will, will, is the goal in the field. Um, I know, Sue, you addressed this in, in your presentation, but if, if you had to say, what do you think the greatest current medical needs for children are um, that you would like to see addressed by 3D uh, printable biomaterials? You know, I think for children, our challenge is always what's going to happen as they grow, what's going to happen as, um, you know, hormones kick in, craniofacial growth is continuing until their teens. Um, and so implanting materials for the long run is, is what we're always thinking about. In terms of greatest need, I really do think that our, we have good solutions for almost everything except for our, kind of our final couple of slides which talked about functional reconstruction. So functional muscle units, um, I think is where we can make a big impact. Okay, thanks. Um, we have lots of people sending in texts thanking you for the wonderful work you're doing. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Which, which, is, which is really, really terrific. Um, what's your best estimate as to when printed ovaries will be available for human patients? Is that the same answer as the kidneys? No, actually, that's probably different because the ovary, since we have you know, very promising results now, I think with our further development, um, we are very close in that target. So uh, again, there, are, there is a stepping stone. One is using these uh, implantable artificial ovaries, for example, under the arm for women who need hormone replacement therapy, so it's a more natural way for hormone replacement. Um, that is, in the near term, I would say five to 10 years. I think uh, the, an artificial ovary, because again of the promising results we have today, that can also um, be within you know, 10 to 15 years. Again, with new materials and new methods, regulation really um, dictates that timeline as well as funding. So um, hopefully we have a lot of support from the FDA as well as financial support to really accelerate this technology forward. Well, I want to thank both of you very much on behalf of RAPID plus TCT. This was all fascinating. Um, and I have... Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.